Now, I'd like to make another point about some of these operations we use within the kernel for doing things, because there's been somewhat of a, a revolution that has taken place really over the last decade, I would say, which has uh, affected the way that people build operating systems. And I'm sure that Linux is also taking advantage of these, these same operations. In order to write code and to take locks or raise urkels or, or do test and set operations where you have operations the CPU supports, where you can like say, I set this bit, and if I set it, I know that I have the lock basically, which means I'm allowed to print my result. Okay, there are operations called a test and set, which are used to build things like semaphores and other kinds of standard uh, synchronization primitives or, or locking primitives. And now I'm relying on my software being able to execute and to take these locks using these low-level operations. Now, what came about in a number of years ago, back in the early 90s, people started to focus on what were called universal synchronization primitives. And there's a lot of research about what you could do there. But what it came down to was an operation called compare and swap, which was implemented in the hardware itself, as opposed into the software by taking one of these operations and building up the idea of compare and swap. So what compare and swap does is it says I'm going to area here. I'm going to have a compare and swap of some operation, some memory location X, like we had before. And I'm going to put it into some register, we'll call it R0 again. I have some other value, and which we'll just call um, say R1, just another register value. Now the logic of this is I want to do, and excuse me, I have one other piece of data, which is R2. So let me tell you what these are. R0 is the new value. This is a write operation. Sort. We'll see in a minute. This is the new value for x. Okay. This is the value we think is in x now. And that's why it's called compare and swap. Okay, we're going to do a comparison about what's an x and our value that we think is an x. And then based on that comparison, we will write our new value, r0. Well, how does it solve this problem? Well, it solves this problem because we're going to read x into r0, OK? And then we're going to say, well, gee, I want to add 1 so um, to r0. I'm going to add it to r0, and I'm going to put it into r1. OK, I'm going to use the registers backwards from what I wrote up there. So what I have now is I have the old value that was in x, which is now in R0. I have the new value I want to be in X. And now I'm going to write my compare and swap operation. And I'm going to say that I want you to write X, and I want you to put my new value, R1, which is the incremented value. But I only want you to do it if it currently contains R0. And now I'm going to use the hardware to do the locking on its buses at a very low level. And this is going to solve this problem, because what's going to happen is I'm going to read out 41. I'm going to try and write 42 back. And let's say that I get there first, and I succeed. Why? Because, well, I check and say, does it still contain 41? Yes. So when I write back 42, it's OK. But the other guy, the other thread that came along, he's going to say, I read 41. I want to write 42. But when I go to write, since I'm the second thread to try and do the compare and swap operation, it doesn't contain 41 in x. It contains 42. So somebody else obviously wrote it before me, as we saw in the example. So let me try again. And so you just like loop, attempting to say, well, let's read the value out, add 1 to it, and write it back. And you, at most, have to go around the loop once. The reason that getting this locking and stuff done there are two very important principles about locking. One is it needs to be correct. And the reason it's so important that it's correct is I've described examples that don't seem very likely to happen. 
I mean, what are the chances that two threads would come through this exact piece of code at the same time and get the right kind of preemption between their instructions? One in a million? Well, gosh, in a modern processor, that's like a thousand times a second if you say it's one in a million, because these processors run in gigahertz. And so, if you have little race conditions, as these are called, because the code is like racing each other through it, if you have these little race conditions, they can be extremely hard to find and occur very rarely, and yet they cause bad results to, to, come, to come out of the computer. So it's very important to have the design be correct. We spend a lot of effort and a lot of science and a lot of technology in terms of analyzers and stuff goes into getting these to be correct. And the other thing is you want the locks to actually allow you to scale the code onto multiple processors. And this is one of the problems that Unix faced for a long time. If you remember the previous picture I had about Unix, is the reason Unix was so much easier to program in the kernel was it essentially took one big lock, which is when it went in, it says, I'm not going to let anybody else run on, my, on the kernel until it's a good place, and I say, OK, you can run. And there was still trouble getting that to be correct. We still had to struggle with that in the Unix world. But essentially, we're taking what's called a very, um, not a very fine grain, a very coarse grain lock, which is essentially over your entire, entire kernel operations. The problem with that is when I get multiple processors, the kernel can only execute and use one processor at a time, even though the kernel itself is inherently multiprocessor. Why? Because the kernel is the most core client server component in any system. If you're running more than one application or more than one thread, even in a single application, you have this kind of client server relationship to the kernel. You want to be able to take advantage of the performance of multiple processors in the kernel. So it's very important that your locking be correct and that your locking uh, be as short as possible, as fine grain as possible. So now I want to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing ever since Windows uh, 2000 shipped. And this has involved the best engineers we've had, including Dave Cutler himself, have been working to not so much increase the correctness, because we think the locking correctness we had was actually pretty good, because we were fairly careful, at least in the kernel components. But it was improving the granularity of locks, of how trying to reduce the amount of time that we have to hold a lock for in order to accomplish some operation. Um, some of the hottest locks in the system when we came out of Windows 2000 were in things like how we allocated physical memory. Because you have this example here about adding two numbers. Well, a similar example is suppose I want to allocate a page of physical memory. So we talked before about uh, it's the file op memory operation where you would come through um, from your application with a virtual address, something like, I'm just believing that's supposed to say virtual, and you would actually talk to some what we call a physical address, which is really just the address of where in your DRAM that particular value lives that you, you want to access. And so to do this, you have to allocate physical addresses, and we group them into uh, pages, which on the um, x86 is traditionally 4 kilobytes. On the Itanium, I think it's 8 kilobytes. And I have to allocate these physical pages. And I'm going to have to do something like take a lock, allocate a page, and then release the lock, because it's very important I not allocate the same page twice, just like over here where I got 42 and I should have gotten 43. And so that is a lock that controls the allocation of physical pages. We also have other locks that control the allocation of processor time, of how we schedule you on a processor. This is called the dispatcher lock. And Cutler came up with some very clever algorithms and did a lot of really good work in figuring out how to break the lock apart so that we could have very scalable across many processors, an algorithm that was very performant across multiple processors, that was very efficient in which locks it used and how long it held those locks and the reason this becomes important is that we're not talking about a system that just runs on like two processors or four or even eight. We want to be able to run on 64, maybe 128 at some point, different processors. And this has actually been work that's been well rewarded to us. Uh, there's a certain types of uh, benchmarks that are very important in the database world, um, the transactional processing benchmarks. And our numbers on those benchmarks, and, and we've done this work in partnership with the SQL team, have improved dramatically 
over the years. In Windows 2000, we built a system that was distributed. It had uh, multiple machines, not just processors working together, but multiple systems working together and communicating over high-speed networks. But we're now able to, on a single system with tightly coupled processors that are sharing memory, be able to get really good numbers for how much data processing we can do. And a lot of that is governed by how much we can do in parallel on multiple processors at the same time. And some of the limitations in that had to do with how fine-grained the locks were that controlled scheduling and physical memory allocation and the allocation of other resources within the system. So we've done a lot of work on that. A uh, fellow who used to work for me uh, in the kernel team, uh, Neil, did a lot of work just thinking about how to take these uh, compare and swap operations and build very effective, very small, highly granular locks. So I want to give you another yeah, example. Here's the one yeah. thing that, that I think is really interesting here is because yesterday I did an interview with a team of researchers and architects at Microsoft managed concurrency. Uh -huh. We're actually working on the concurrency problem for developers. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, they're not going to be the ones to solve it. I mean, that's yeah. pretty grandiose to think that a group, one group, is going to be an industry-wide problem. But locks is, is, a, is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And since you're really, it's just important for people to realize that we're getting into the nitty-gritty of what a lock is, yeah. and this is good. I just wanted good. to throw that out. Good. Okay. So um, I want to talk about one of the general problems, which is related to locking, that we have in the kernel. Do you want to switch tapes then right now instead of waiting um, for three minutes? No, let's wait for three minutes. Just for three minutes. Then okay. we'll switch to different kind of. oh. um, We have a lot of data structures in the kernel because this is how we remember state. This is how we know what we're doing, what we're working on. We can remember what we were last doing. So the model of how an operating system works is it gets the CPU periodically. It modifies data structures in response to some kind of input. It can be an, an interrupt from a device. So it's an I.O. interrupt. It can be an application request, or what we call system calls. And we come in, and now we manipulate the data structures. And in fact, this is one of the weird things about working in the kernel. Maybe at the end, I'll talk about what's weird about working in the kernel, is that we modify the data structures, and that causes the system to behave differently. It creates the virtualization that you mentioned at, at the outset. Now, these data structures come and go very quickly within the kernel. And because the kernel is fully concurrent, or it's highly concurrent, let's say that, um, they can come and go in one thread while they're still being used in another thread. And so these data structures end up being marked with a reference count. And in fact, and, and people are trying to figure out, you were mentioning one of the research projects before, how to get away from having to manage all these reference counts. And we're still not there yet for kernel level code. But in managed code, where the reference counts are managed implicitly in a system, not by counting references, but by looking for references. That's what garbage collection is, because this is a hard problem to get right. But we do have these reference counts in the kernel today that we keep to tell us whether a data, data is still in use or not. One of the reasons is it's very important for as soon as the reference count goes to zero to free the resource and not like wait for the garbage collector to come along later. Or if the garbage collector comes along while you're showing your movie and the movie so that's one of the reasons we haven't fully integrated um, managed code, such as that that uses garbage collectors and that kind of memory management into kernels is because of this kind of problem. So what we have is references. We need to be able to increment references and reduce them, because when the reference goes to zero, somebody's going to say, I don't need that data structure anymore. I can throw it away. But if we were still using it, that means that that data that we thought we were modifying could be put to another use, and we could corrupt the system. And this is creates blue screens, and nobody enjoys seeing blue there screens from the system. And so you have to take a reference counter. And C, C is called like a plus plus operation. You need to add one, which is similar to the thing we showed before with the lock. And now today we do that by using the compare and swap operations to do an call them interlocked operations because the hardware interlocks the operation. And one of the clever things that Neil did was he said, you know what? For frequently used data structures, I can actually use compare and swap on the reference count and pick encoded in lower order bits in the address some number of additional references. And I can actually do this in a cache aware system across multiple processors. And then the scalability for certain of the locks and certain of the reference taken that he got, and he called this fast referencing, greatly improved the scalability of those data structures. 
And this is just one example of the kind of innovation in terms of concurrency that's been going into the kernel uh, up through Windows Server 2003. Fantastic.